Thank you, Mr. Kroll, for joining us for this discussion. Uh, well, Dr. Ko, uh, obviously China-ASEAN uh, trade relationship uh, you know, for the first quarter, as we said, 1.35 trillion yuan. Uh, again, uh, you know, ASEAN countries uh, becoming this, uh, the largest trading partner of China. So how do you see, you know, what do you see as the main pillars for this economic vitality between the two sides, or in this region, for example? Yes, indeed. Uh, we expect actually growth for the region to be quite strong this year, uh, you know, 4.7% for the whole region. And for ASEAN economy in particular, about 5.1%. So this is a very strong recovery from last year, which is 2.9%. And the main reason for that is because I think the macroeconomic fundamentals of the region is still very strong, despite the pandemic. And even though with the scarring and all that, uh, you know, it has remained uh, uh, intact. Uh, and this is a tribute to the you know, the many years of reform, you know, uh, that have taken place after the Asian financial crisis, the region basically built up, uh, you know, very strong uh, balance sheets. You know, they strengthened their fiscal policy, monetary policy, and then during the during the last two years when they were hit by the pandemic, they basically were able to support the, the economy quite well. So now that the the the, the pandemic is is subsiding, they are able to bounce back uh, quite strongly. You know. If you look at the region, inflation is low, the external position is strong, you know. So that's one reason why, you know, uh, you know I, I think the region is bouncing back. And beyond that, of course, uh, there's also the, because the region has been growing quite rapidly over the last uh, few decades, uh, there has been a very strong, uh, rapidly rising middle class, uh, you know. And the region has become a huge market now. And so it, it, that becomes a driver for growth on the demand side, right? And it's also a very high savings uh, uh, rate in the region. So investment in the region is quite high and there's a lot of intra-regional uh, FDI flows as well. Um, and on the production side, the region has built up a very competitive uh, regional production network, you know? So it's highly competitive. So these are all the, the, the main driver, you know, for a very dynamic region. <laughs> Uh, well, of course, you know, uh, starting from this year, at the beginning, actually, um, the world's largest free trade deal, RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, took effect. RCEP was reached uh, during the time of uh, the rise of anti-globalization. Uh, so I wonder if it makes this pact, uh, you know, carry more weight in terms of a free trade and the regional integration. Yes, uh, I think, you know, uh, the pandemic has revealed also the vulnerabilities, you know, of the uh, uh, global supply chain, right? Uh, there were disruptions, massive disruptions, uh, and production shutdown and all that. So I think that's one area where, you know, I think uh, we, the, the region can do more to try to improve the resilience of the global supply chain. Uh, and this means that, uh, instead of a, in just in time, you want to be just in case, right? Moving towards a, a strategy. And the best way to achieve that is through diversification of your sources of supply, building up inventories, okay? And maybe becoming even self-sufficient in, in some key products, okay? But this idea of uh, moving, you know, um, withdrawing from the global value chain uh, doesn't work, okay? Because the global value chain is extremely efficient. Uh, it leverages on the competitive advantage of individual countries, okay? And so while you can, you know, produce some parts or some products, it is not possible to produce everything yourself, right? So I think going forward, there will be a reconfiguration of the global value chain uh, so that, you know, it's become more resilient. And I think that, you know, it's, it's going to be good for the, the world anyway, because, you know, greater resilience means that if there's another shock, we won't have this massive disruption that we have seen uh, in the past two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Dr. Ko, of course, you know, with this uh, two years uh, pandemic and which is yet to be over, fully over, and then uh, you have this Ukraine war, you know, many people are worrying uh, about like whether this is the end of globalization or the supply chain will never be recovered or uh, be the same again, let's say. Uh, are you concerned with uh, that kind of development? Uh, yes, we were very concerned. And so last year uh, we did a study, you know, on this particular issue exactly. And so we look at the uh, global supply chain and we, we did some survey, we look at surveys and all that. And it turns out that most of the, the, the suppliers who are here in the region are here to stay. 
I mean, there are very few of them who, are, who wants to move out. And, and the reason is quite simple because uh, first, I mean, I think the region has a very efficient ecosystem for manufacturing. It's very hard to replicate that you know, in elsewhere, right? And secondly, many of them actually are here now in the region because they want to produce for the, con for the market in the region. You know? So it doesn't make sense for them to move out of the region, right? Um, the region, as I mentioned earlier, has become a huge market, you know, and it's, a, it's become a magnet for many uh, multinationals and, and investment into the region. So because of that, I think the region is, is a very large, you know, uh, um, market in itself and very efficient and it's going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you look at this uh, ongoing Ukraine war, uh, and also sanctions. Uh, obviously, I mean, this region is less affected, but still, you know, how serious in terms of the, the effects on ASEAN member countries uh, because of the war, because of the sanctions? Well, we look at this and again, uh, you know, the, the bilateral trade between the region and Russia or Ukraine is quite small, right? So the impact through trade is actually quite small, quite limited, but the indirect impact through commodity prices, high inflation, through disruption to supply chain, you know, and also through, it, it's very, can be much more significant. And also there's a risk of uh, stagflation, you know, because if inflation rises uh, very sharply uh, and become much more persistent, then there's a risk that uh, the, U, the, U, the Fed and the ECB may have to tighten policy much more in order to uh, contain inflation. And that could, you know, uh, throw the, the economies into a, a downturn or a recession. And if that happens, then the, the impact on the region is through the demand side and it's much more significant. But already we, we've seen the, 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 the spillover into the region through higher inflation. Uh, some countries in the region, you know, like the Philippines and uh, Thailand, they have a much higher inflation uh, recently than, than before. And, uh, and most of that is because of the higher fuel prices and, you know, in the case of uh, Thailand, I think, I think there's also food prices that's gone up. But these are supply shocks. Uh, they're, they're not driven by demand. On the demand side, the region is just coming out of a, a, a very soft growth last year, right? So the, 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 the impetus to inflation for the demand side is actually quite small. So our advice basically is that because it's a supply shock, there's not much you can do about it. Inflation, even though it's 4%, is still quite low. There's still room for you for them to keep accommodative policy a little bit longer until you know the, the, the recovery is stronger and then they should begin to tighten policy uh, so that they, are, they don't fall behind the curve right uh, so our our view is that you know the risk is there but it's really quite uh, contained right now uh, but if the war in the Ukraine gets prolonged and sanctions expand you know and then there's a risk of stagnation in the US and Europe, and that would then uh, have much greater spillover effect on the region. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you mentioned about the inflation. Uh, I wonder like, if uh, the Fed uh, or ECB um, the raise interest rates or in raise interest rates uh, uh, say more frequently. Um, people are worrying uh, and worried that whether there will be a spillover effect uh, on the developing world. Uh, um, are countries in this region also worried about that? I think uh, they are, but you know, we, we, we monitor this very closely because that's one of the big concerns that we have, that this increase in interest rate will trigger, for instance, an outflow in capital, right? And that has happened uh, in, before in the past uh, during the uh, taper tantrum when the Fed announced that it was going to start to raise interest rate. And there was a massive outflow of, of uh, capital from the region. This time around, the region is a lot more resilient, you know, uh, so far they have you know, despite all the uh, in announcement about rising interest rate, you know, there's been very little outflow of capital of uh, funds from the region. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, the external position has strengthened uh, since 2013 after the table tantrum. And there's been very little borrowing from abroad. Uh, so they are able to extend this uh, you know, uh, higher interest rate now much better than before. And as I said, because inflation is still quite low, you know, they have space. They are not in a, in a sim, similar situation as many other emerging markets where inflation has, has ratcheted up to you know, very high level, you know, in some cases double digit, and they are forced to tighten policy very sharply in order to contain the inflation. Here in the region, inflation is still relatively low. 
So because of that, they don't have to tighten immediately. But of course, you know, it is something they need to monitor closely. So for instance, uh, you know, the governor of Bank Indonesia, Pak Perry, has been asked this question many times. And he, he said that, you know, we will tighten when we see inflation, you know, become a, a, a major concern. <laughs> Uh, yes, if you look at uh, the uh, China ICM uh, relationship or, or the trade relationship in particular, you know what's the next stage uh, for both sides uh, to deepen their cooperation, probably to increase their trade, and uh, rely on each other even more because they are close uh, geographically, it's in, and more resilient, you know, for both sides uh, uh, to become in terms of supply chain, in terms of uh, the trade between them. Uh Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I think China, you know, uh, is very closely linked to the region. You know, it's, it's part of one, you know, very efficient supply chain. And the region produces a lot of intermediate inputs that feed into China. But China itself has grown <laughs> and become a major source of market for a lot of final products now. And so the linkage between the two regions is very tight. Um, on the, Including the services, you know, I mean, China was the major source of uh, uh, tourism market tourism for, for the region you know uh, unfortunately at the moment of course you know because of the border closure you know uh, it's taking a it will take a while for the tourism market here to, to recover fully but the region is opening up the border and is expecting you know and that's going to be another source of, of uh, driver for growth for, for the region and you know at some point in time you know i'm sure china will also open up the border and you know and and that would also strengthen the, 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 the tourism industry in the region. <clears throat> mm -hmm. A related question, of course, both China and ASEAN countries are inside this RCEP uh, trade agreement. Uh, and also there's uh, another trade agreement, which is seen as, uh, you know, with a high standard, that's a CPTPP, uh, you know, comprehensive and progressive uh, trans-Pacific uh, partnership. Uh, so uh, is there any intention, any plan, for example, to uh, probably also improve the standards of RCEP, uh, uh, you know, probably to match that of CPTPP one day in the future? <laughs> well, I'm sure the, you know, another way to do this is to invite new members into CPTPP. And I know that China has already applied to be a member. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you can either expand, you know, the, 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 the coverage of the CP, R RCEP, to include more uh, services, uh, which is what I was suggesting in the beginning. And the other way is to, of course, expand CPTPP to include more members, right? Uh, and I think that will happen as well. Uh, I think there are more members applying to CPTPP right now. And so that's a higher, uh, more advanced uh, type of uh, arrangement because it covers uh, procurement, you know, government procurement and, 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 and other uh, aspect which are not covered in, in RCEP. But as I mentioned, uh, I think RCEP is already quite uh, 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 advanced in terms of the, the coverage, you know, and it will facilitate, you know, the, the further development of the global value chain in the region, which I think is, is very important for the region because the region has basically grown in the last four or five decades on the strength of, you know, the, the manufacturing supply, supply chain. And I think it's very important for the region to you know, try to continue developing that. And it, it benefits not just the region, but it benefits the whole world. You know? I think more and more countries will be able to enter into the global value chain. Uh, and they don't have to produce everything. They just have to specialize on what they're good at, right? And plug into the global value chain and you know, benefit from everybody else's uh, you know, uh, 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 competitiveness as well. So you know, to, to us, the CPTPP is, is good because it covers a broader range of uh, you know, issues and, and uh, but at the same time, I think we need to uh, also focus on the RCEP. Yeah, focus on the RCEP. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Kaur. Thank you for accepting my interview uh, for your insights and time. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xin Thanks for being with us. See you next time.